I would like to personally apologize to our followers. Um, our Mandalorian episode, we had some technical difficulties when we were recording that because the lovely people over at Xfinity decided to cut out the Wi-Fi when I was recording with Matt, and I was not made aware of this. So oh, no. I got cut off the second half of that episode, so I apologize for that. That was a they forgive you. unexpected expected technical difficulty which i'm still kind of angry about thinking about it but it's okay it's life it happens just sorry about that in advance no i was gonna say it just made me laugh how much dad's into the doka jar and ship i asked him i was like are you like do you want them to be a thing he goes well it seems to be the most conclusive path i was like dad he's correct i didn't figure yet for (laughs) doka jar is gonna be a thing i'm telling you it's gonna be a real thing um, definitely some development there this episode, um, but not a whole lot else. I mean, there was some, there was, it was packed in kind of dense. I thought it was a good episode, but, uh, you kind of mentioned this earlier. It's like, we only have five episodes left and there's still not like an overarching story. Welcome everyone to the show, the, another star Wars podcast show. Uh, we're here to talk about Mandalorian season three, episode four, the foundling, which could be about a couple different people they love to do the dual meaning things with star wars yeah they really do the titles um and this one could either be about little baby grogu or whatever pause vizsla's kid's name is like ragnarok or or ragnor that's it ragnor (laughs) Ragnor. yeah um (laughs) so yeah interesting um but before we dive into that actually i don't want to get too ahead of ourselves because we can do a full episode breakdown star wars news what do we got Star Wars what news. Do you got? What do you got? Uh, wow. In a not shocking twist of events, what's his name? Lindelof? Who was re- Lindelof. Yeah. yeah, this dude who was set, was he set as the director or just a writer? He was set as the director, correct? For he was the, set as the director. And for I think the up- he did write it. He had a screen he wrote the screenplay for it though. Too, okay. So he was the director and, and the writer. Okay. <laughs> um Lindelof <laughs> has reportedly left the untitled Star Wars project that he was set to direct. At this point, I feel like we've been groomed to expect this. If you catch my drift. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be in disarray over there. I don't I know people don't love Kathleen Kennedy. I don't know enough about her, but it seems like she had something to do with this. I also heard that she, her like her entire role at Lucasfilm was dependent on uh, a, a Star Wars movie coming out in 2025. So maybe that's why they pushed it in the first place. And then apparently there were some other rumors going around that like the script wasn't very good or something, which that's totally subjective. We don't really know. But they're all over the place. I mean, we are. These are all just rumors, by the way, that we're like reporting on. But like a couple of weeks ago, we reported there's this movie coming from Damien Lindelof, and then now all of a sudden it's no longer happening. So what's going on? There is a disarray in the Lucasfilm family. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's from Variety, dude. So that's pretty official. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, it says. The original screenwriters, Lindelof and Justin Britt Gibson, have departed the project Variety has confirmed. So it's legit. Like, he was a set director. He was a set screenwriter. And now he's no longer a part of it. <laughs> also, I saw yeah. something. Uh, this is also relevant. I saw something about, like, Rain Johnson's uh, unconfirmed trilogy, maybe confirmed, not entirely sure it's in Star Wars Purgatory, has been, like, officially scrapped. Did you see that? No, I did not. But that seems to be good news. For, <laughs> for is it Ryan who... Johnson? Is it Ryan Johnson or Rain Johnson? How the heck do you say his name? I think it's it's Ryan. It's just he's trying to be fancy with the way he spells it. Of course. Or his parents were trying to be fancy, whatever. It says there are a couple articles that say uh, trilogy reportedly canceled for real this time. <laughs> OK, well, hey, I'm not I'm not opposed to that. If you're going to make content, make it good. We had how long? 20 years? Not not quite 15 years to make a new Star Wars movie, not 15, 10 years to make a new Star Wars movie after Revenge of the Sith, and they kind of beefed it, in my opinion. So let's not rush to make another movie if it's not going to be excellent. 
Also, I feel like they just jumped the gun on giving him a trilogy. Like, they were like, oh, he did The Last Jedi. By the way, guys, here's his upcoming untitled trilogy. And then after The Last Jedi got the backlash that it got, they panicked. And they were like, okay, we're going to put this on the shelf and then we're going to quietly hide it. <laughs> so it's not happening. That's exactly uh, what happened. <laughs> the um, My thing is this. I don't think Ryan Johnson's suited for Star Wars. So I'm going to be frank with you. I'm kind of relieved if he's not touching another Star Wars project. Like, I just don't think that's the best call. Yeah, Let I him mean, go look, off I, and do his things. <laughs> but Yeah. I, wa- I liked Glass Onion. I liked Knives Out. I think they're interesting movies. Did, I don't think his directing style translates to Star Wars. Now, we can't blame him 100%. I don't think he wrote The Last Jedi. Did he write The Last Jedi? I don't know. I think the writing is probably one of the biggest problems. He had some cool direct directorial <laughs> choices. In The Last Jedi, like, there was some really cool cinematography elements. Um, like, the throne room scene in that movie is good. I'll give that he credit. He was a writer. Um, he was. Okay. So, in that regard, yeah, I just – I don't think he necessarily translates to, translates to Star Wars. I don't think he's a terrible director. And I don't think he deserves, like, all the hate that people throw his way. But I did, obviously did not like The Last Jedi. I, I don't think I've ever walked out of a movie more disappointed – like in my life, that's I'm not a slight to him <laughs> per se because there's a lot of moving parts that go into these movies. It's not all on the director. There's a lot of things that go into it, and a lot of that, in terms of creative direction, which is mainly the problem I had with this movie, was the creative direction uh, that comes from the suit guys, and everyone has their fingers in the pie, and they want it to be this certain thing. Mm. And what's our brand of Star Wars going to be, and how are we going to do these characters? And then they just kind of ruined what whatever his name is, J.J. Abrams did with the the. <laughs> The uh, Force Awakens, which I thought wasn't the best movie, but it's the best out of the new three, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I'd has agree the with best, that. It has probably the best movie trailer in the last 20 years Was the, for The Force Awakens was amazing. Um, mm-hmm. But then they just totally backpedaled and did a bunch of weird stuff just creatively that I thought was bad. Uh, there were some dialogue choices I, I hated, especially in the first scene of The Last Jedi. I don't. That was when I knew we were in trouble is when they're making like the your mom jokes. And I'm like, oh, God. But um, look, I don't have any hate towards Ryan Johnson. Uh, If he ends up not directing, maybe it's probably for the best. And I what might be better, though, too, is like keep the same director for your next three movies. Keep the same. teams. Let them have the same creative vision. Like Star Wars is Star Wars because of George Lucas. The fact they didn't even go off of his ideas and he didn't really have much of a part of the new movies. That's where the problem was, in my opinion. So that's my word vomit for the last five minutes. I think the directorial thing you just said about having the same guy or woman doing like uh, all three movies in a trilogy makes a lot of sense. And the fact that they keep splitting it between people who have massively different visions, you end up with something like the sequel trilogy. And if they're going to do another trilogy, they need to give it to a specific creative team and let them do their thing. Because then otherwise you're just going to end up with disasters like we had with the sequels. I'm not like, I'm not a huge Ryan Johnson fan. I'm not super attached or, or angry. But at this point about, you know, The Last Jedi or seeing him direct a new Star Wars project, I I can't watch, watch The Last Jedi because <laughs> honestly, yeah. I, I can't watch it because I I was so disappointed like you say when we walked out of the theater and it was ironically it was on tv the other day and i watched maybe five minutes of it and i was like i don't even remember this because yeah. the last time i actually sat down and watched it all the way through was in theaters when it first came out and yeah, i was like I you know what this thing like a year ago same thing i was like mm. and i was but, like you know what this doesn't bring me joy and i'm not gonna watch something that <laughs> is going to get a very negative reaction out of me yeah it's tough because i uh, in regards to that as well, like I, there's an important note to make that where George Lucas didn't direct all three of the original trilogy, right? Mm-hmm. Like Irvin Kirshner or whatever directed Empire Strikes Back, which is arguably the best one. Not in my opinion. I do think it's very good, but I don't think it's the best Star Wars movie. Um, but he didn't direct it. But George Lucas was still involved, right? You have the same people. And what you said earlier, like you have to have the same team. And I think that was one of the major problems with Star Wars was they didn't think it through with one team and go, here's the vision and let's plan it out of where this Mm -hmm. is all going to go. They just kind of winged it without the main guy. Like George Lucas didn't really have a huge say in any of that, which I think was a big mistake. Say what you will about the prequels, but they've aged like sweet wine and people look back on them very 
uh, they, they got a lot of criticism at the time. People look back on them very nostalgically and very positively because at least it's true to what Star Wars actually is. So mm-hmm. that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I think also, too, it's like it kind of speaks to why Dave Filoni stuff's so good because he still calls up George Lucas and consults him on major plot threads or questions that he has, which I just think shows, you know, respect for the guy who created it, but also like he wants his input. He wants to know, he's like, Hey, is this in line with your vision? Is this what you would have seen for this story that I'm writing? And I just think that's really cool. And I don't know, it it just seems like it's kind of a mess over there right now. And nobody really knows what they want to do and they don't know what they should do. And it's just wild to me to see these projects being announced, canceled, announced, canceled, announced in purgatory, canceled. Like yeah. it's just at this rate, I don't have any, like, I know how this works. You know, it's like the format of uh, episode of Phineas and Ferb. It's like you get into Phineas and Ferb and you know exactly what it's going to be about. and You know exactly how it's going to end. And it's like the boys never get caught. Lucasfilm has kind of geared us to have a certain expectation by this point, which is none of these things are being made. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I don't I don't know. I, I don't get my hopes up for any of these announced projects anymore. But we just got to see what ends up happening because you never know what's actually going to go in production and what's not. Yeah, I think they need to change their strategy, make something more along the lines of like they need to do to Star Wars what Christopher Nolan did to like Batman with like the Batman Begins, Dark Knight Rises. Oh, yeah. Similar type of thing where you kind of reinvent it a little bit and make it seem something a little different. If you don't have George Lucas involved, you might as well stop trying to copy him or like or at least if you are going to then involve him. But if you're not, then make it something. You know, evolve it a little bit, which is what I that's a positive thing I have to say about Andor. They were trying to evolve it and make Star Wars a bit of a different thing. And I don't think it hit on every single level, but it was interesting. I'll, I'll quote Hansel from Zoolander. I didn't love it, but the fact they're doing it, I respect that. I Sting, I don't really listen to his music, but the fact he makes it, I respect that. I mean, I did, and I did like Andor. I think there's a lot of elements of Andor that I think were risky and ballsy and good for Star Wars, like in the way that it was shot. The production they did there, they were, went on a limb and were trying something different and new. And I think they need to explain that to more parts of Star Wars. So if they're doing a new movie with whoever it is, take some of those elements from Mandalorian and whatnot and insert them into that movie. And let's get something fresh and new that isn't just a new hope regurgitated. <laughs> okay. Um, I feel like we need an entirely separate episode on here's our issues with the sequel trilogy and yeah. what we would have done to fix it. Yeah. I feel like that would make yeah, a good Yeah, we can do an episode on that if we ever have time in between <laughs> recording I mean, look, breakdowns and reactions. For Bad Batch is over next week, Star Wars. so we should be fine. I mean, I even noted this in my last reaction video. I was like, it's just crazy. I mean, you know what's been going on with me at work and your schedules. Uh, probably a little bit crazier than mine right now. It's just uh, as soon as Bad Batch ends, I feel like we're going to have some breathing room a little bit. Because we'll be like, boom, 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 I know we've been posting so much. I've just been drowning and it's been such a busy week at work too, but uh, it's all good. We had a good Mandalorian episode, which let's jump into that now because we have some stuff to talk about. Are there any more Star Wars news before we do? Because I feel like I'm, I'm missing something. Uh, No, not for me. I don't think. Yeah, no. Okay. Well then, my liege, take it away. Okay. <laughs> Uh, this is Mandalorian season three, episode four. This one was written by John Favreau, Dave Filoni, and directed by none other than Carl Weathers, who we love. We love Carl Weathers. Um, he is great in so many different things. His range as an actor is incredible, from Predator to Arrested Development to Star Rocky. Wars. The guy, Rocky, everywhere. <laughs> I mean, the guy's amazing. Um, and I think he did a good job directing this episode too. I, I enjoyed it. I think it was a very enjoyable episode. Too short. Maybe make it longer next time and don't dedicate 60 minutes towards a character I don't care about. But uh, <laughs> I thought this episode was great. Uh, just make it longer. The official description is Din Djarin returns to the hidden Mandalorian covert. So we jump in at the tribe's covert. The members are training in combat, hand-to-hand, blaster training. They're just shooting at the water, which I thought was weird. There's no targets out there, but they're like, hey, we're practicing. Pew, pew, pew. And they're shooting at nothing. Weird way to train, but okay. You guys do you. <laughs> uh, we see on the beach, Grogu surrounded by what looks like stones. He's using the force, picking them up, uh, moving them around. And then we see that they're actually crabs. Cute moment here. 
Uh, Din sees him playing around and picks him up, moves him to a training area, and says he needs to uh, challenge the little stinker guy, uh, Ragnarok. Ragnarok. Or whatever <laughs> Ragnor. Uh, or I don't know. Uh, Bokatan walks over and is like, hey, is this a good idea? Mm-hmm. And he's like, if he's ever going to become an apprentice, he needs to start at some point, which I think is a cute little lesson as him as a new dad. He's thinking about it the right way. You have to challenge your kids a little bit. You have to push them outside their comfort zone. You can't helicopter parent. You can't be too protective of them. You need, you need to let them get out into the world if they're going to learn anything. So I think parents, and especially new parents like me, can take a page out of this book. Let your kids do dangerous things carefully, I believe is the quote. So. That's kind of what Dan is doing here. Uh, the judge gr- agrees and says, uh, Bo- uh, Bokatan, Grogu is too small to fight. <laughs> and Din is like, no, he's my ward. I can do whatever I want. So they decide to do a darts training exercise. Ragnar is asking why Grogu doesn't wear a helmet. Din's like, he's too small to speak the creed. And does just like, puts this kid in his place. This little snot-nosed kid who uh, doesn't like Grogu for not wearing a helmet. Also, and, uh, his ears. Say, how, do, how is that going to work? I don't know. It'll be cute, though. It'll be it'll be weird. Maybe they cut out like, little did, things. And it's... I was like, do the ears just stick out? Is Maybe that how that's going to back. He just folds them back. Wouldn't that be uncomfortable? Probably. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they're starting to give Grogu armor like bits, bit by bit, and it's just getting more and more ridiculous, and I'm just waiting for the day where he just has the full Mando garb. I know. I wonder also, what that's going to look like. That day and when he starts like actually talking, I'm going to be like, mm, he's not as cute. When, it, when, his, uh, when he uh, hits puberty and his Danny DeVito voice breaks through. Hey, I'm Grogu. <laughs> hey, I'm from the Bronx. I'm Grogu. <laughs> I'm an Italian. What What is Yoda's species called? Bring the know? Gabagool. <laughs> um, Din says, one does not speak unless one knows. To which Ragnar, decla- Ragnar declares he does know. And then Din says, perhaps the lesson's for you. Boom roasted. Um, they do this dart training thing. Uh, classic movie trope here where he loses the first two rounds and the last round he shoots the guy three times. Does a cool, cute little force flip. Uses his knowledge to beat the snot-nosed kid. Cute stuff. So as Ragnar walks away, he is snatched up. <laughs> I thought this was so weird. He's snatched up by the giant dragon thing, right? And they're shooting at him. And uh, Paz is like, no, you can't shoot at him. You might hit the kid. Um. And then they kind of act like this happens all the time. Like, yeah. Like, we'll get him later. We'll find him later. And I'm like, what? He just stole your kid. What do you mean? He, how does you know he's not going to eat him immediately? <laughs> Wait, we'll go get him later. What? Which, by the way, if this is like a regular thing. Why haven't they moved away from that planet by now? Or at least like that area. Dude, the, the amount of monsters near this lair, pick a better <laughs> place. Have some better defenses. They picked it near the, in the most dangerous area, apparently. I just, it doesn't make crocodiles. any sense. Like, why are they still there? It just doesn't seem like, I don't know. It just seems like more of a hazard, <laughs> you know? And it's not like they're doing much there other than being in hiding. There have to be better places to hide, are they? Which, by the way, brings up another point. Are they on Navarro? Like, what planet is this on? I don't know. I don't think you're supposed to know. Because when uh, Din gives Bo the coordinates two episodes ago, he's like, I know a secret special place. And they don't really say. So I don't think. Oh, right. Right, 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 Um, right. It's just weird to me that they're still lingering here. (laughs) I know. You guys, like, have a better fortress. Like, you're you're getting ambushed by dragons and crocodiles all the time. Let's, Let's get some better defenses here. Um, cool, some cool stuff here. The while they're flying through that canyon, I thought these shots were really cool. You do feel like you're on that planet. I thought the yeah. effects here and stuff were really great as they're flying through the canyon with their jetpacks. Some really cool cinematography choices on like on the side of the jetpacks and stuff like that. Uh, very interesting in these uh, this planet. Whatever the planet is, it is. It's cool, and I would like to go there. Bokatan tracks down this beast. Uh, they find in- out where it lives. That Sorry, camera shot of her ship going into the sun with the. Very cool. um, the dragon thing, whatever it was. I think Carl Weathers did a great job of creating a lot of immersive shots in the action. I'd say during this episode. Yeah, yeah. It, the the do, all the directional directional choices here were great. Here's the shot you're talking about. Very cool. Looks very very unique, and I think you're right. He did make some really good choices here. It was very immersive in a lot of different ways, especially in a scene coming up, which we will get to. Mm-hmm. Um. So she's like, hey, he's at the top of the mountain. We'll have to sneak up on him. He's going to hear our jetpacks. And I'm like, why are we wasting our time? There's a child over there who may or may not be dead. We don't even know. And your guys <laughs> yeah. are just like, we'll get to it. We'll figure it out. Okay. 
<laughs> time seems to be of the essence, but whatever. It's fine. Um, cute moment here as uh, they fly away and she, the, the, the whatever her name is. Uh, the armor. armorer. Yeah. Emily is Swallow. Like, you're too, yeah. You're like, uh, you're too small to go, Grogu. I feel kind of bad for him. He's so cute. It's ridiculous. He, <laughs> she's like, come on in here. Come hang out with me. And he does his little Grogu walk, which is just adorable. Ridiculously cute. <laughs> this is gotta, so adorable. We have to show it because it's just too cute. To, uh, look, at this little, look at this little walk he does. <laughs> 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 it's so cute. You he can watched... tell that the the prosthetics team and just yeah. like the puppeteers were probably cracking up when they did that. But this is what you want <laughs> out of Star Wars. Like this is that's what I love. This is what I love about Star Wars is it's clearly practical <laughs> effects, but I just love it. It's kitschy and cute and amazing. Um, also, uh, it reminds me of the way he walks. It reminds me of the way the puppets walk, the marionettes walk in Team America World Police by uh, the South Park guys. Uh, they walk oh. kind of the way they, like, across the screen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought that was amazing. So they go inside this cave. Well, well, well guess what my go-to was going to be? What? Those those old stop-motion movies that we used to watch as kids, <laughs> like uh, like Rudolph. Yeah. Or you know yeah, how they'd the like glide? Yeah, yeah, like the claymation, they'd glide through the, the snow or whatever. <laughs> That's kind of what that looks like. Yeah, totally. Uh, it's uh, It's well done. I'm, I'm glad they've been able to make him walk now. Make it makes it look more realistic. They're in, the, they're in the cave. The armor's lecturing Grogu about something. She's so on her high horse. Um, well, being forged she, is like yeah. forging metal is about growing as a person, or that was her analogy, or something like that. Yeah, and she's melding the signet or whatever, and putting something together for him. And as this machine is rhythmically. Slamming down, creating this piece of armor for him. We get, uh, and he also looks very sad and scared here. I felt bad. He has his eyebrows up, and he's like, "Oh." I felt Which, bad by the way, he's emoting a lot more. Yes, he is. Uh, that's a look I don't think we've ever seen before. Is this one in particular? This scared little man. His eyebrows actually lower, which is crazy because I don't think he was emoting that much in the first two seasons. Yeah, I don't think so either. They've definitely improved upon. His animatronics, if you will. Mm-hmm. So as it's rhythmically slamming down, we get an interesting moment here as Grogu flashes back to the day of Order 66. Mighty unexpected, I might add. Very unexpected. Was not was had no clue this was coming. Very good scene. A lot of emotions here in this scene. I don't know how you felt, but I, this sucked me right back to... Revenge of the Sith. Like, I felt I mean, like it was just the way it was shot, the music behind it. It just, it brought me right back. I felt like we were just watching a uh, deleted scene from Revenge of the Sith or something. I really like the the music, too. The the little score that was written for uh, the Order 66 scene. The... I really like that. It yeah. really, I, I don't know, they really pull at your heartstrings and pull you back into the tragedy of Order 66. Also, we're never going to get away from this in Star no. Wars media. I feel like it just constantly creeps back, especially in any Dave Filoni-related project. Like, this was a Dave Filoni-written scene. This oh, scene yeah. and what happens after was just Dave Filoni. Because you can 100%. feel his handprints all over this. Hundred <laughs> percent. It's just so obvious to me. Yeah, it definitely. He had his hands absolutely smothered all over this scene, which I love, <laughs> by the way. There it is a tragedy behind it, though. It's a really big plot point. The good guys lose, or the supposed good guys lose. And I mean, it was yeah. just, it was really impactful in the theater when I watched Revenge of the Sith for the first time. And it's a good moment to to hone in on, to focus in on, and it makes it so much more impactful here. As you see, like a the, Grogu somehow looks younger here, which I thought they did a really good job of, mm. and. He just looks so scared and hopeless, and you just feel bad for him. You feel the anguish in the moment. You know what? Like, how are you going to hate this guy? Look at this. Look at his. <laughs> look at his hands. He's so cute and nice. And I'm just like, the poor little guy is probably terrified, and you want him to get away, even though you know he's going to get away. You feel so bad for him in that moment because he's probably so scared. So something I want to ask you on the topic of Grogu, which he is such a precious little bean. I mean, like, look at his hands clasped 
around the blanket. It's so <laughs> precious. It's so cute. My question for you is, are they just protecting Grogu just because he is a child? Or are they protecting him because he's maybe a little bit more important than we all understand he is? I think he's a little bit more important. Why are they all around him? Why are they all protecting yeah. him? They all, they even have a line, save the youngling, bring him to whatever the guy's name is. Kellerin, I think. Yeah. Something like that. You hear them say that like in the dialogue and stuff. So I have the impression that he's more important somehow. Probably has a high M count. Probably Yoda's child. Clapping cheeks with Yaddle. Um, <laughs> honestly, honestly, though, is like, could his importance be related to the fact that he's a member of Yoda's species and maybe they're extinct i mean i i don't know yeah that's that was my impression as well like why was he with them too like they all went all the other younglings like we saw this with reva in kenobi during order 66 they're all just fending for themselves there's like six of them mm -hmm. or whatever that wasn't the case with him he's in his cute little pram running around they're all protecting him get him to kalari monger or whatever his name is kellerin i think is his name i think it's kellerin boom kellerin kellerin um, beck Kellerin, yeah, yeah, something like that. But yeah, I had the same, I had the same feeling as well. It's an interesting point, and I think they wanted to you to feel like that a little bit. Like there's still some mystery behind Grogu, which is good. Well, and then uh, the question of his value to the remnants of the Empire, because even Doctor Pershing mentions that in season two, he mentions that Grogu has a very high M count, which obviously midichlorian. I mean, what else could that stand for? <laughs> Yeah. So I, we know he's a value there to the Empire specifically, but it just seems that the Jedi were also super aware of this and whether or not that's just related to him being one of the last surviving members of Yoda's species or if they knew he was going to be a target. It could be a lot of different things. And I still think that there's a lot of intrigue there. And so I'll be interested to see how they continue to carry that storyline forward. I know we only have four episodes left of this season, but it's yeah. interesting. I, Grogu's character is mostly shrouded in mystery. It is, which I like. I like it leaves more to be wanted. You don't want to give away too much mm. when you're telling a story. One other thing here, and I want to get your thoughts on this. I don't know how I feel about the lightsabers. How do you mean? I think they're they don't they're like almost too vibrant in their color. Does that make sense? This might be me nitpicking yeah. a little bit. They don't look the same. They look a little bit like props they look like something you'd buy on a website and they just they doesn't resonate with the star wars that i'm familiar with and that's probably why it feels weird to me but just the way they glow and stuff it's not done the same obviously now they don't just mm -hmm. have those metal rods and, and do it in post they're actually glowing and i'm sure they just turn up some different settings on premiere pro or whatever the hell they avid mm -hmm. or whatever they edit with i just i just don't know how i feel about it i'm not saying i don't like it it's just i'm not it kind of takes me out of it a little bit because they look like they look like props, in my opinion. The I thought also, the same on, on thing that. in I thought the same thing in the Kenobi show in, in the opening shot of the Kenobi show. You know, with that yeah. Jedi Master who's protecting all the younglings. I distinctly remember thinking when I was watching it for the first time that the lightsabers felt really bright. And yeah, you're right they they, they, because they, they reflect more because they're actually reflecting off the walls. Yeah, because they're they're actually glowing and that's they probably change what it is i'm not saying i don't like of it. the environment yeah that's 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 a good point too because you're right there they actually are glowing when they are doing the scenes but it just it feels a little weird to me also the choreography with some of the jedi i didn't love again i'm gonna nitpick here here or in general lately in general oh, for the most part like it just doesn't feel super natural to me a lot of it feels very choreographed. And we'll get to a specific scene where that's uh, a little bit more apparent. Yeah. But just if you look at all of them individually, like in the way they fall down, it doesn't look very organic to me. But I don't know. We've been spoiled with great lightsaber choreography in the past. Like Phantom Menace, Revenge of the Sith, Attack of the Clones. It is phenomenal. So, again, I'm not saying I hate it. It just doesn't feel the same in a way. In, I think... I think the best way to put it is it kind of comes off fan filmy, which is a lot of a what bit. Kenobi came off as. I mean, Kenobi had a lot of elements that fan films tend to have, which is shaky camera, 
you know, the very staged choreography, you know, the lighting of the lightsabers, because they're actually using, you know, things that they've either made or that they've bought at Disney. And you can just tell that there's something not supernatural about it. And I think that you can see it play off here. You suspend your disbelief, but it's almost hard to dis- suspend your disbelief, you know, when you're watching something like this. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel, um, especially like in Kenobi, for example. His lightsaber was super bright, and we already know what Obi-Wan's lightsaber looks like. It's not that blue. It's too vibrant in its color. And I just I feel like with these, it's felt kind of similar. Again, I mean, I'm nitpicking here. I'm very much well, nitpicking. But well, I mean, it does look at take this. me out of it a little bit. Let's pull this up real quick. That. Yeah, it's also the way they glow. Also, the, the blur, mm-hmm. the motion blur that, that's with them. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And it's because they're computer generated more. But yeah, it looks well, totally oh. different. I mean, look at it. That's more of like a indigo color. You know what I mean? Well, well I mean, look, also look at his color, look at, and then look at look at then look at what the colors of these these are like. Well, here's the here's the thing in with Obi Wan versus Anakin. If you look at these shots and you pause them, the lightsaber color is not glowing off their face. Like yeah. they're not swathed in like blue. For example, if you zoom in really closely on their face here. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Like, you can see, it's not reflecting off of Anakin's body. It's not reflecting off of Obi-Wan's body. And then with these real lightsabers, you're actually getting this bright blue light that's hitting them, which is probably a little bit more realistic, but it it does change your perception because you're used to seeing it one way. Is is it more realistic, though? Like, how much light? This is an interesting question. How much light do lightsabers actually give off? I'm supposed they're supposed to give off a lot because in like in, in, in Jedi Fallen Order, you can use it as a lamp, like when you're walking through dark caves and stuff. So I, I would imagine they're supposed to be pretty bright. So you're right. It probably is more accurate. It just – look, I'm being picky. It's something I've noticed. I don't hate it. It's just, it, it's just I guess, different. That's all. It, change, it changes the, the way you see it. Great. Yeah, just yeah, it, completely. I just need to adjust my – the way I'm viewing it, I, I suppose. All right, moving on, we get to this cute scene where Grogu is scared, backs into this uh, elevator. Look at him. Look at my little man. Oh, and then so we have the biggest, the biggest moment of the show, uh, which is right here. And this really threw me and caught me off guard. I don't know about you. But yeah. we get our boy Ahmed Best back again. There he is. There he is. The king. I didn't recognize him at first. I was like, I knew his face, but I'm like, I know him, but I don't like, because I I didn't know Kelleran Beck or whatever his name was, was actually a Jedi, which I guess he's not really, but I I knew I recognized him from somewhere in Star Wars. I just didn't remember. So like literally in my reaction video, you can see I'm sitting here just like my eyes are darting and I'm trying to remember who it is. And then I'm like, oh, it's not my best, but I did not recognize him immediately. I, what a treat. And this yeah. is just – this is Dave Filoni for sure. Yeah. I, I can imagine that they were sitting in a room and they were like – and Dave Filoni was like, what if what if it was Ahmed Best? You know, what if that can be his grand return to Star Wars? Because the poor guy has had a tumultuous experience with the Star Wars fandom, especially after the prequels. I, so to have this be his grand comeback is just like so well-deserved. And it, it was just good to see him. So I'm yeah. happy he got this opportunity. He also has I'm the happy sick that they put robes. Him in. Look at these. Yeah, awesome oh robes. my god, dude, the gold lining. So dope. So, then, so, so, so cool. Very good decision, I thought. A very creative decision to bring him back, because everyone was obviously wondering who was it gonna be. Such a cool scene here. Like what a redemption for him as well. Like he gets to yeah. be the badass who saves Grogu. Now I thought here again, I think some of this choreography here was a little Staged. underwhelming. Yeah, I think it could have been better. He should have done some more spins and stuff. Like, that was dope right there. That was awesome. This was awesome. That was really cool. But then there's a move right here he does, which I do not like at all. This. <laughs> <laughs> I did not like that part. You Just know that what little gets me flourish is he does. That little camera shot where right there, that one. Yeah. You can tell he's standing in front of the volume or a CGI screen, and it really bugs me. Uh, this there. One? Oh yeah. This you one. can tell yeah. he's standing in front of the volume or a CGI green. I don't think they use green screens anymore. I think the volume's pretty much taken over at this point. But you can tell it's not real, and or you yeah. can just tell that there's a disconnect between him and the environment that he's in, and that really bothers me. Um, yeah. But but I, overall, I mean, like, like that was like chills. That scene, I thought. 
was just really yeah, good. I thought it was, I think, I don't know if I actually had any expectation. Maybe you can also answer this, but I don't know if I've actually had any expectations as to who would end up being the person to save Grogu. Like, my best guess would have been Jocasta New or something. Like, I don't think it would have been Obi-Wan because he was too busy with his own thing. I didn't think it was going to be Mace Windu because, again, busy with his own thing. I, I don't know if I necessarily had any expectations. I mean, could you say the any, same? No. Yeah, I didn't have any expectations. I, I didn't know who made sense because Obi-Wan was gone, obviously. Mace Windu was dead. So Yoda maybe, but no. Like, this, this was a good decision. It's like... It's a guy we're bringing back, Ahmed Best, who played Jar Jar Binks. For those of you wondering why we're freaking out over this, he was OG Jar Jar Binks, which I also think had unjust amount of hate. Yeah, it was um, ridiculous. I liked Jar Jar Binks when it came out. Granted, I was like eight. Not even. I was seven. But whatever. He's he's a corny part of Star Wars, and he got a lot of hate for it and whatever. I don't know why, because Star Wars fans can be losers sometimes. But this was a cool way to bring him back, reintroduce him to the series as a really cool character that saves a really important new character. And they didn't need to have it be a really big character. You can have someone like this and then reintroduce him, and then you can do more with him now. There's mm-hmm. other stuff you can do with him now. So it was, it was a smart move, in my opinion. I, I never really gave a second thought to Jar Jar Binks when I was a kid. I just kind of accepted him as a part of the movie like it wasn't a big enough deal where it ruined the experience for me I'm like okay well Jar Jar is a little obnoxious but I'm not sitting here you know angry over the fact that this character exists like he didn't like make or break the film for me in fact he only has like a few scenes you know yeah, there's he some has... really dumb stuff like with the when he's fighting the battle droids and stuff and he's like stumbling yeah. around with the giant gumballs that's pretty stupid <laughs> But um, you know when, he, like, I mean, when he's slurping the frogs and stuff, and Qui Gon holds his tongue, or when he's in Gungan City, I don't. I think that's all fine. I don't, and it's not his fault as an actor. I think he did a good job with it. Um, and it was uh, the the way I view these movies and stuff is like, what's the best parts of it? Phantom Menace has a lot of bad moments, but I fair. think the good moments there outweigh the bad ones, and that's what I try to look for in these movies. I felt, the, I, did, I felt the same about Attack of the Clones. I remember everyone saying Attack of the Clones, the word that kept coming out was cheesy. It was a cheesy movie. I didn't really like it. I'm like, dude, it was awesome. We had so much cool stuff. Count Dooku, Anakin fighting with two lightsabers, Yoda fighting. Are you kidding me? That outweighs all the stupid stuff. Sorry, mm. but it does. And it's the same thing with like Phantom Menace where we get Darth Maul, one of the coolest bad guys, arguably, of all time. With Qui Gon Jinn, one of the coolest Jedi, he's probably my favorite Jedi of all time. With Obi- a young Obi Wan Kenobi fighting for the fate of Anakin, and you get the stuff with Palpatine and him infiltrating the Senate, and the political stuff in that movie is very interesting. When you watch it as an adult, it's like cool. So I always try to to look at that, and I, I try to do it with these shows too. Like I always try to give it the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't always, you know, meet my expectations. With TV shows, it's a little bit different because you're watching them episode by episode. But mm-hmm. yeah, I guess that's that's kind of my point is like you got to find the, the good things in this and i hope i come off that well way. like i also I try to it's find just the good in each episode it, it i think that's a good a good take to have on it i just think that you know it, all criticism always should be directed toward you know the writing it goes back to the writing and i think that's what most people try to express is like what was happening with the writing in the sequels or what was happening with the stupid little gumball scene with jar jar yeah. uh what was going on with the writing and i think a lot of times people will just outrightly attack the actor when all they did was get a script and then read the lines they weren't responsible for the lines. I mean, Hayden Christensen, given the right direction and given the right dialogue, can act. He can. He just needs the right direction and he needs the right script. It does, but he got all of this hate as Anakin, and then Ahmed Best got all this hate as Jar Jar, and then Dr- Jake Lloyd got all this hate as a nine year old kid because somebody didn't like the writing. And I just think at the end of the day, it's like perfectly valid. Criticize the character. Criticize the writing. Criticize the creative decision. But just leave the person out of it. Like, they literally just looked at lines and they read them. I know. I mean, and there's some cases where actors do kind of beef it and they deliver lines wrong. Because at the end of the day, the role is your creative interpretation. But in some circumstances, there's only so much you can do if the dialogue is bad and the story is bad. Anyways. Uh, Anyway, our point being, Ahmed Best is back and we're happy to see him. We're happy to see him. This was a really cool shot here. I love this Jedi Temple burning. I thought that was awesome. This whole chase scene here was amazing. 
I love Coruscant. Inject so Coruscant cool. into my veins. Um, Again, with the camera angles, I think Carl Weathers had some really fun direction. Like, I actually, like, I was having a really good time watching this sequence take place. Yeah, I was too. This was a really fun chase scene. Uh, very much similar to the book, the best chase scene ever in the book of Boba Fett with the Power Rangers. This was almost no. as good as that. It was almost as good. <laughs> I forgot about that until you mentioned it just now. I, I truly <laughs> forgot about it until you mentioned it just now. It's the best fight scene or best chase scene ever. Um, so yeah, this was. I agree with you. Fun, well directed, well shot. Uh, it was just a, a fun scene. There was a couple shots I thought were a little green screeny uh, coming up. I'll here agree with you there. Face. That was going to be my follow up point. Right, wait, where is it? Did I miss it? There my, oh, right here. That that, that shot, <laughs> like a little green screeny. But uh, overall. I really enjoyed this. I thought, you know, Coruscant's amazing. It's I'm so glad we get that back. He obviously escapes um, in one of those cool Naboo fighters, which I thought was awesome. I love those big oh, shiny ships. Dude, the Naboo guard showing up. I like it took me a couple seconds. I was like, they're outfits. And then the second that they fired their blasters, the boy, boy, I was like, that's Padme's Naboo guard. Wow. Which was you- such a cool element. I did, was not expect. I wasn't expecting any of this. So like getting the chase scene in Coruscant and then Grogu and then the Order 66 stuff and then the Naboo stuff. I'm like, okay, amazing. Really, really cool. My question for you is where are they going? Hmm. That is – okay. So so there's, there's two trains of thought I have here. The first thought being is did you see the theory going around that Padme was the one to send the Naboo guards to help any Jedi escape? No. Did, did you not. see that theory going around? I think it's a really cool theory Be- because this is like Padme's task force, kind of like her handmaidens. And so the the theory that she could have been the one to send them, I'm a big fan of because I think that's very much in Padme's character to do. So if she did do that, maybe they're going to Naboo or might mm. be like a hideout place. Like maybe Padme organized something like I, I don't know. Like there clearly was a plan, though. Because yeah. when Kellerin comes out to talk to the main Naboo guy, he's like, the Naboo guy's like, hey, where are the others? And Kellerin goes, there are no others. So it sounds like they had a plan to escape and then meet them there and then go to another secret location from Coruscant. So possibly Naboo. I'm not sure. Maybe there was like a an underground railroad thing for Jedi going on. I don't mm. know. Maybe somebody schemed that. Interesting. Well, hopefully we find out this season. What do you um, think? I don't know. I don't know. A Naboo theory, theory is, is good. I think that's an interesting route with Padme helping them escape. But I truly I don't mean, know. It's... I'd be interested to see because then he obviously gets abandoned at some point. So that's kind of sad to think about. But Abandoned anyways, or they um, all, or Kellerin just gets killed. Yeah, true. So we get the, from, the, from the flashback. Grogu's looking cute as ever. Uh, the armorer has finished making his cool little plate thingy. Whatever that was. Chest plate. Chest, <laughs> Chest plate. plate. Attaches it to him, his next piece of armor, with the beast on it, the mud beast or whatever. The mythosaur? Right? Mudhorn. Or mudhorn. Was mythosaur? No. It was a mudhorn, yeah. It was See, a mudhorn, you're right. I know right. more than you. God, I'm so much smarter than you. Yes, I'm so much smarter than you. And I know more things about Star Wars. Yes! Anyways. I think we should have a trivia contest episode. You would win. You would win. Don't. <laughs> kick your ass. <laughs> mm, I'd, I would actually. You would not kick my ass. I would give you a run for your money. Dude, I um, would kick your ass in Star Wars trivia. Mm, debatable. Debatable. Uh, okay, this might have to be an episode. Okay. We will see. You're you know a little what? cocky look for up my trivia. Taste, I'm going so to gonna... put you in your place. I'll put um, you in your place like didn't put that kid in his place. <laughs> so uh, cool scenes now as they we cut back to the search party going to find Ragnarok or whatever. Very Western vibes here. Feels like a posse is out to go find a young kid. You know, like the sheriff is leaving town with his posse. You know what I mean? Very, very Western-esque uh, with the landscape and everything. They have their campfire. They're eating around the campfire. I thought that was a really cool uh, creative choice. Um uh, Din is obviously giving them, or not Din, Bo is giving them instructions on what they're going to do. Uh, and she's learning a lot about their culture as well and how you, they have to find a place to eat with their helmets off, which is psychotic, by the way. Um, but she gets the great honor of eating by the fire. So they're starting to respect her and she's starting to respect them a little bit, you can tell, which I thought was interesting. She's kind of becoming 
immersed in the weird cultish ways of the covert. She's learning and learning to respect. She's learning to respect. Next morning, they start scaling the wall. They get up to the top. They find the dragon's nest. And very tropey movie scene here. You kind of know what's going to happen. The thing's going to pop out somewhere. Although it did kind of catch me off guard, I will say, when they're looking for Ragnarok or whatever. The dragon comes up. It's scary. It's Or its little baby kids are there, too. Um, good good effects here. I thought the CGI here was, was really, really, really well done. Um, the thing spits up the kid out of his mouth, which the kid is bone dry, which is bizarre to me. You'd think he'd be And alive. That. Yeah, that was weird. I didn't really love that decision. I don't know how he's not even a tiny bit wet or hurt. Like, he comes out of the thing's mouth, and, like, it, it just kind of took me out of it a little bit. I don't know about you. Well, it just, you know how in this scene, following right after when Paz Vizsla gets half eaten by the thing... And then yeah. the dragon picks up Ragnarok or whatever his name is with his claw. It's like that didn't even like crush his yeah, like here. spine a little yeah. bit. Like that shot right there, like that would have hurt him. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Um, Iron Man vibes right here as Bo-Katan comes down. I thought this was cool. I thought it was a cool scene, cool action sequence, though, as they go after the kid. Um, they fight. They love fighting beasts in The Mandalorian, don't they? Yeah, they do. Jurassic World scene here as it comes out of the water, the big crocodile thing. Very Jurassic World-esque. It's almost shot for shot from Jurassic World, actually. Yeah. Where it comes and bites the thing. And then father and son are reunited. This is the way um, from Paz Vizsla. He's very happy. Which, by the way, I guess uh, their beef is over now. I guess so, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. They've been at each other's throats. And I even said this in my reaction video. I was like, well, he saved Paz's kids, so now they're going to like each other. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he better. I mean, you better be thankful if you save his kid. They get back, and then they brought back the dragons with them for some reason, which I don't know how she had room. That doesn't seem like a safe Yeah, that was back, so that was weird, a, that dude. Weird. I feel like they'll, they'll, those will come into play. They'll probably train them, and the Mandalorians will use them somehow. We'll see a Mandalorian riding one or something at some point. I wouldn't be surprised if that's where they're going with this. They brought him back for a reason. They're not just going to never talk about it again. And if they don't ever talk about it again, that's just bad writing. So <laughs> I would imagine they, they'll bring up the, the dragons again at some point. Then we get to another interesting scene, I thought. Interesting way to end, where the armorer makes Bo-Katan a new shoulder plate. And Bo-Katan is like sitting in mommy in the principal's office or something and comes clean to mommy about how she saw a mythosaur. And I saw a really funny meme about this where it was like the old lady meme where someone's like, I saw a mythosaur. And it's like it has like Bo's face. And it's like, sure, sure, grandma, we'll put you to bed. Like one of those things. <laughs> like I know no, exactly like the meme you're talking about. Her. Walking with the crutches. <laughs> yeah. And like the armor just is like, yeah, wow, that's crazy. Can't believe you saw that. And she's like, no, I, I saw a mythosaur. And she's like, yeah, sometimes you see him. And she's like, what? <laughs> it's almost sometimes like. Sometimes you see him. Somebody commented. They were like, it's like the equivalent of saying that you saw Jesus to a priest. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. and just be like, I saw Jesus. And yeah, like, and have the priest be like, sure. "Oh, that's cool, nice." Yeah, I speak to Jesus every day. Actually, we see him when we're in the church in the Eucharist. And you're like, "Nope, that's not what I mean. I mean, a re- <laughs> I saw Christ. He had, he had the stigmata and everything." And they're like, and they're like "Nope, that's pretty cool." But you're so what crazy. Did you think of this? What does she mean by this? I I don't I was know. Confused. It came, I'll be honest. It came I was off really... a little passive aggressive, like, oh, sure you did, sweet. Oh, I'm sure you saw the mythosaur. It, I don't know. I don't know. Because I, I, they're such zealots that you have to think that they'd at least that believe that the mythosaur exists. You know, it, it is strange to me that she was so quick to deny it. Also, the fact yeah. that Bo told her and not Din. And maybe it was because Bo didn't really believe what she saw. And then after kind of being in the weird, super religious Mandalorian culture, she's like, hey, by the way, I saw this. She confided in their leader because the armorer is basically like their leader right now. I thought it was weird that she was kind of like, eh, not really. I think she's also feeling her out to see what this means because she doesn't even know what it means. My other, The other way I interpreted this is maybe she didn't actually see what was under there. When boat when Din got sucked under the water, maybe I don't know. It's like a spiritual awakening thing for her, or like maybe she's this is like her. It's a metaphor for her coming around to this. Uh, so, this are you saying that she didn't see it, or that her seeing it 
is a metaphor for her learning to accept other factions of Mandalorian culture. I'm saying maybe she didn't see it at all because the armor is like, yeah, you see him sometimes. So maybe it was like a vision for her or something. I don't know. I don't think that that's the case. I'm just saying that's a possible interpretation of the scene. It could also just be a really good metaphor, like you just mentioned, for her learning to accept yeah, the other that's, parts that's, of that's the other thing culture. I'm thinking yeah. is like, yes, like it could be, or it could be both. I don't. Know. I think I, the way it's coming off to me right now is I don't think Bo's told anybody up until this point is because she's been in such disbelief. But what is strange to me is the fact that the armorer told Din Djarin it is foretold that. When the Mythosaur rises again, it's going to herald a new age of Mandalore. So the fact that Bo said this and the armor had no reaction was just kind of like, okay, so does the armor really believe that then? I don't know. I was I was a little confused at this at this scene, to be honest. It wasn't super clear. No, it was not clear. Maybe it's supposed to be that way, but I don't know. I was just like, okay, so she doesn't believe her? I thought you'd shit your pants if you found out there was a Mythosaur. It's crazy. Highlight here, though, I will say. Bo-Katan is climbing up the ranks in terms of good Star Wars characters. She is really, Katie Sackhoff has translated really well to live action, in my opinion. Mm. And she's done an excellent job. And I really like her character in this season thus far. And um, her and Din, whenever they inevitably get together and get married and have little Mandalorian babies, that's going to make her even cooler in my book. She, I agree with you. I think that she's had this, like, such a smooth transition to live action and she looks great. I mean, she really looks the part. And I really think that they've aced her makeup and her costume, especially for this season. I mean, I know that wig was kind of wonky in the first season, but now they've just mastered it. So I think she's she has been very, very seamless into this show. I also like how much conflict they're creating in her right now. Like, she's becoming very complex. You can tell that she really regrets her young days as a uh, Death Watch Mando. When she was looking, mm. working with Pre Vizsla, mm. and I really, I really like that some of that conflict's coming forward. I think the way it could get even more interesting is if they start digging into her backstory with Satine, and yeah. how they were at odds because Satine was a pacifist and Bo was a warrior, and obviously those are two viewpoints on the like total opposite end of the spectrum so i'd be super interested to see if they would bring in some flashbacks to further explore that backstory and maybe how that plays into her conflict moving forward yeah i totally agree um i definitely you definitely get the vibe and it's nice to have the vibe of what you just said and it's nice to have the cohesiveness of her character from animation to live action and obviously she has that context which she's brought into the character which has been cool Let's jump into our favorite section, which is T-shirt winner of the week. Everyone's favorite section, which is who wants a free T-shirt, which is the worst name for a section of the segment of the show ever. But we'll have to come up with a better segment name. But we'll call it T-shirt, t-shirt free winner T-shirt time. section. Free T-shirt section time. Um, our winner this week is Ben V. So Ben, you have won a free another Star Wars podcast T-shirt. We will send it out to you. Congratulations, Ben writes. I have been thinking about this for a while. What if Grogu is the Mandalorian? What if he's the one who unites all the Mandalorians? He could be a Jedi Mandalorian like Tar Vizsla. He already displays the Jedi instincts and is a Force user. He has demonstrated the Force ability to calm animals when they stop their rancor. This may help him tame the Mythosaur. Also, his species lives a very long time, so he could rule Mandalore much longer than any of the other Mandalorians. He does does. not have a lightsaber yet, but maybe Grogu somehow ends up with the Darksaber. Just some thoughts I've had kicking around for some time. What do you think? Am I way off base? I would love to hear your thoughts. Okay, looks like we lost Melissa, but I'm going to give my thoughts on this real quick while we wait for her to join back. So I think this is a great question. It's something I've actually been thinking about for a while. Um, for the last, I'd say, actually for this for this season, I'm like, what's the interpretation of The Mandalorian here? Is it actually Din or is it more about Grogu? And this has this been the plan all along? Um, I don't think you're way off base at all. I think this is a very plausible theory and it actually makes a lot of sense to the ending of the show so let's say we go to season five or season six uh, eventually if god willing we have that many seasons <laughs> and um maybe it comes to a point where grogu grows up a little bit we have some more of a, a time jump and we get to see him grow up a little bit and become a mandalorian and then it inevitably comes to a point where din dies rather whether it's of old age or fighting in a battle or something like that um and then grogu takes over and takes over the lightsaber or, or the dark saber or something like that i think it's definitely a, a real possibility and i think it's an interesting way to look at it too because then it kind of 
gives us an idea of where they're going to take the show, um, which I think is um, which I think is a, a real possibility. So I I don't totally agree with it, uh, but I think we might get to that point where this is revealed where this this has been the the case all along. So yeah, I think it's a great question, and it definitely helps you view the show in a little bit of a different way. Obviously, there's going to be some time before he even wears armor and like a helmet and all that stuff too. So I don't know how likely that is going to be or how likely we are to see that but maybe we end you know a a season or two from now with i guess the story kind of heading in that direction because i know dave filoni has mentioned a couple times that that's where like he has multiple seasons of the show written out or or john favreau wrote that out like he he knows where the story is going to go so i guess it's just a matter of if they actually go there or not but that's it for me that's what i have to say melissa doesn't look like she's been able to join us again uh she might be having issues Overall, great question, Ben. Thank you for writing in. Uh, Please send us your address and shirt details, and we will get out a free Another Star Wars Podcast t-shirt to you soon. So, yeah, that's it. That's it there. Well, that's okay. No worries. Uh, We (laughs) will have to remove Melissa for the time being, but I think she enjoyed it. I enjoyed the episode, too. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I don't know what's what's going on. I think she must have uh, internet issues or something like that, but I enjoyed the episode, too. For me, this is... um, this is probably a 7.981 ish for me. I thought it was really, really good. The Ahmed best stuff was fantastic. And um, the flashback scene was amazing. I, I do agree with Melissa that we need a little bit more cohesiveness to where the show is going, but I'm enjoying it. I hope that they have a lot more of a storyline and story arc for the next four episodes, which I imagine they will. Um, but that, that is worrying me a little bit too. So I'm hoping we have that coming up in the next couple of weeks, but we have four episodes left to go. If you guys want to tune into our next breakdown episode of reaction videos or Bad Batch breakdown, Bad Batch reaction videos, make sure to click like, subscribe down below. Click the notification bell so you always know when we're coming out. And don't forget to leave us a nice rating on Spotify, Apple, Anchor, Breaker, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, anywhere you get them. It really helps us. Let us know what you guys thought of the episode in the comments below or our community page. And don't forget to write us in next week at another Star Wars pod at gmail.com for your chance to win a free t-shirt. I got to get going, guys technical difficulties everywhere but we made it through the episode uh we will see you guys next week on another star wars podcast see you later